Hi, I'm Neil Hilborn, and I'm a poet and spoken word artist. Um, you might recognize me from a video of a poem of mine that went viral about seven or eight months ago. Uh, it's called OCD, or as I like to affectionately refer to it, uh, bearded dude is funny, then sad. <laughs> So, the theme of this conference is Agents of Change, uh, and I'm going to be talking about the change that I've seen since that poem went wherever it went. Uh, but, there's a story behind it first. So, here's the story. Uh, when I was 11, uh, I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. My mother, my wonderful supportive mother, who's in the audience right now, um, she noticed that I was a, you know, I'd always been a perfectionist. I'd always been a really kind of rigid, odd kid, but she noticed a real inflexibility in my, my obsessions and my needs and desires, and so she said, well, maybe we should get this kid to a shrink. Um, sure enough, OCD, um, and so I spent a lot of my adolescence and formative years in, in therapy, which you know sounds horrible, it was actually great. I really learned how to deal with a lot of the obsessions and compulsions through a bunch of therapeutic methods, like, um, breathing exercises, or mantras, or um, just really anything you can think of, and I really got a lot of the obsessions under control. So now, for instance, the only real tick that I have that you can notice is like, well, not real, there are many of them. The most prominent is that when I walk down a set of stairs, I have to hit the top stair with the back of my right heel. Right, um, so all, all compulsions come out of obsessions, and all the obsessions are based in some kind of fear or anxiety. In this case, the fear is that I'm going to fall down the stairs and die. Um, so by checking where the stair is, I'm, I'm reassuring myself that the stairs are real, thus assuaging the compulsion. Um, I don't really know where that fear comes from. Like, I've fallen down plenty of stairs, and I'm not dead, um, probably. Anyway, uh, so fast forward. I'm in college. It's my sophomore year college at uh, McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. P.S. I moved to Minnesota from Texas. That was a shock. Uh, <laughs> my mother, wonderful, supportive, loving woman that she is, was like, oh, we'll get you a jacket. You'll be fine. Um, not fine. Anyway, uh, so it's my sophomore year. I'm in a meeting of my literary magazine that they mentioned, haha. <laughs> uh, and so in walks in this guy. He says, I'm, I brought a slam poem to workshop. Um, anybody who's never been to a poetry slam, it's basically, it was just a game that was invented in the late 80s by a construction worker named Mark Smith. Uh, it's, it's a trick to get people to come to poetry, to, to, to poetry readings. Um, we can talk more about the details later if you'd like. Um, there are many of them. Anyway, uh, so he does this slam poem, and it's terrible. It's so bad. Um, his name, this guy's name's Dylan Garrity. He later became my business partner, friend, roommate, and I would tell him to his face that this is an awful poem. Uh, but we were, we were all bad back then, so whatever. Anyway, uh, but he did this terrible poem with such conviction, and he just meant it so hard that I was like, well, okay, cool, I can do this. Like, this is, this is a fun way to do poetry, because I'd been writing for my whole life, but this was something I'd never seen before. So we started the McAllister Poetry Slam, um, and I went to a bunch of spoken word events in the Twin Cities, and uh, it went from there. So fast forward again, it's my senior year. We're sending a team to the College National Poetry Slam, which was in Ann Arbor that year. And I was talking to my coach during the, during the workshopping season, and I was like, oh, haha, it's so funny. I have asthma and OCD. I'm so broken, haha. <laughs> um, and she said, Neil, that's actually funny. You should probably write a poem about that. And I go, well, well okay, sure. Um, so the first draft of OCD, right? And OCD is like the poem I'm known for. It's like, I, I think the video's got like six and a half million views or something. And the first draft of it was just a, it was a snarky, fake, angry breakup letter to a woman who left me because, and I quote, um, I'm crazy and my lungs don't work. Uh, so I brought it to the team and they were like, well, Neil, this is kind of funny, sure. Uh, and so we went through edi the editing process. And I don't, I don't compete with or seriously perform with a poem unless it's been through at least 10 drafts um, because I'm meticulous. And so as we're editing it, we, I, you know, I gradually start losing some of the, the jokes in the back end and the asthma starts kind of falling out of it. And I make it more and more serious as the poem goes on. Um, and then, then we went to College Nationals. We actually won that year um, with this poem, um, and it goes something like this. The first time I saw her, 
everything in my head went quiet. All the ticks, all the constantly refreshing images just disappeared. When you have obsessive compulsive disorder, you don't really get quiet moments. Even in bed, I'm thinking, did I lock the door? Yes. Did I wash my hands? Yes. Did I lock the door? Yes. Did I wash my hands? Yes. And when I saw her, the only thing I could think about was the hairpin curve of her lips or the eyelash on her cheek, the eyelash on her cheek, the eyelash on her cheek. I knew I had to talk to her. I asked her out six times in 30 seconds. She said yes after the third one, but none of them felt right, so I had to keep going. On our first date, I spent more time organizing my meal by color than I did eating or talking to her. But she loved it. She loved that I had to kiss her goodbye 16 times or 24 times if it was Wednesday. She loved that it took me forever to walk home because there are lots of cracks on our sidewalk. When we moved in together, she said she felt safe, like no one would ever rob us because I definitely locked the door 18 times. I'd always watch her mouth when she talked, when she talked, when she talked, when she talked, when she talked. When she said she loved me, her mouth would curl up at the edges. At night, she'd lay in bed and watch me turn all the lights off and on and 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 off. She'd close her eyes and imagine that days and nights were passing in front of her. Some mornings, I'd start kissing her goodbye, but she'd just leave because I was making her late for work. When I stopped at a crack in the sidewalk, she kept walking. When she said she loved me, her mouth was a straight line. She told me I was taking up too much of her time. Last week, she started sleeping at her mother's place. She told me that she shouldn't have let me get so attached to her, that this whole thing was a mistake. But how can it be a mistake that I don't have to wash my hands after I touch her? Love is not a mistake. It's killing me that she can run away from this, and I just can't. I can't go out and find someone new because I always think of her. Usually, when I obsess over things, I see germs sneaking into my skin. I see myself crushed by an endless succession of cars, and she was the first beautiful thing I ever got stuck on. I want to wake up every morning thinking about the way she holds her steering wheel, how she turns shower knobs like she's opening a safe, how she blows out candles, 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 blows out... Now, I just think about who else is kissing her. I can't breathe because he only kisses her once. He, He doesn't care if it's perfect. I want her back so bad. I leave the door unlocked. I leave the lights on. So that's how the poem goes. Um, Thank you. I appreciate that, thanks. Um, So I've been doing that poem forever, right? We we won College National that year. I went on tour a couple times. um, And I did it every night, every performance I'd ever been in. Um, And I eventually got tired of it. I felt like I wasn't delivering it with the same sort of conviction I had been before. So I retired it, right? And then we went to this, we went to this competition in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and my friend, uh, Sam Cook, who's the CEO of Button Poetry, who recorded the video, he's a big part of the reason why I'm here. So thanks, Sam and Dylan. You're great. Anyway, um, and they, Sam was like, Neil, just go do OCD. Go do it. I don't have a good video of it. Just get up there and do it. So I recorded the video. Not much happened. And then that August, right, we're driving to the National Poetry Slam. Uh, in Boston and we stop in Cleveland and we stop for the night and I wake up in the morning and my and Dylan says Neil you're on the front page of Reddit OCD has like a million views and I'm like no shut up no stop um, <laughs> that's not it's not happening no cut it out um, and then over the week it got more views and I did interviews with like NPR and Huffington Post and uh, a ton of people saw the video and it was really cool so that's the story of the poem change I'm here to talk about change. Uh, I noticed a huge change in my life. I signed with a booking agency and I'm touring professionally now. Like poetry is my job, which is nuts. Like you can make money doing poetry. What? (laughs) I've been doing it for uh, close to a year now and that's just crazy. Like I don't, I, it's still bizarre to me, but uh, this isn't about me. I'm not talking about me. The first, the first major change that I noticed was in internet comment sections, like on Reddit and um, Facebook and HuffPo and even on YouTube comment sections. YouTube, the cesspool of the internet. Um, I love you, YouTube. You pay a lot of my bills. Thanks. Um, but seriously, you, you know YouTube comment sections. People were start, were being, one, incredibly supportive, and two, sort of self-editing and really policing the way that they talk about their lives. Like a lot of people were saying, 
oh, I thought I had OCD because I needed to have my pens in a specific arrangement. Um, and that's clearly not what's going on, right? That's not what's happening in my life. Um, and I've just noticed it's so hard to get people about the way, to get people to think about the way they use language and the ways in which their use of language might be oppressive. I'm, I'm not claiming an oppressed identity here. I'm a straight, white, cisgendered male. Like, I'm pretty set. Nothing bad has ever happened to me. Um, but still, people thinking without any prompting about the way that they talk about an, an identity or a life that they don't know anything about was incredible. Um, and the second and maybe more striking thing to me was I started getting messages, like emails, Facebook posts, messages on Reddit, on Twitter, just everywhere of kids, not kids, people, mostly between the ages of 15 and like 22 saying, I have bipolar disorder, I have OCD, I have depression, ADHD, any mental disorder you could think of. And they were saying, and I, before I saw your video, I'd never seen anybody talking about their mental illness, um, which is mind blowing to me because I, I grew up in a family where we just kind of talked about it. It was just something that happened and it wasn't shameful. It was just what was going on with me. So um, all these kids, not kids, people, people, Neil, um, <laughs> were saying, I, I, I can talk about it now. I, can talk, I tell my friends about it. It's not just something I can, talk, I can only talk about with like my therapist or like the one person who's closest with me. And I, it's mind-blowing to me, this sort of stigma that we have in America, and maybe the world. I can't speak to the world, but certainly in America where uh, a mental illness is something shameful. It's something that you should only talk about with your immediate, like your parents and your therapist, and that's it. So if you can take anything from this... Um, so I said I don't, I, don't, I don't have any statistics. I have one statistic. Um, and that's one in two. 50% of people, all people, experience are experiencing right now some kind of mental dysfunction. So if it's not you, it's the person sitting next to you. Um, <laughs> seriously, though, it's, it's true. Um, and I mean, like, I, I, that's, that's really funny to me, but it's, it's, it's something that's really going on in, like, at least half the people in this room, maybe more. I don't know. Um, I don't know your life. And so here's the thing. Um, the, I don't know how to fix mental illness. I don't, know, I don't know how to fix this stigma, but I know that the place that helped me start was being able to talk openly and honestly about it. So if you have a mental illness, just don't be afraid to just talk about what's going on in your head. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not something horrible. It's not the end of your life. It doesn't define you. It's just part of who you are. So find somebody that you trust, tell them just what's going on. If you are that somebody that they trust now, I'm again, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I just know that this is what's worked for me. The people in my life who have really helped me just listen. They're not trying to fix me. They're not trying to change anything about what's going on in my head to say, I hear you. I love you. I'm listening. So, change, right? If you want to be an agent of change, two things, listen and speak up. Thank you. <laughs>